Yes. So, so we turn now to the evidence of Dr. Richard Lane, who was the director of BPL from the autumn of 1978 um, to 1990. Um, if we just bring up on screen CBLA 605 underscore 002. You will see there the first of the 484 page draft proof of evidence um, of Richard Spencer Lane, um, which I'm going to be referring to. Um, this is really the only evidence we have from Dr. Lane, apart from obviously the l large volume of contemporaneous documentation to which he contributed or which records his views. Um, there is no statement or evidence from Dr. Lane subsequent to 1990, so no evidence to Lindsay or to the Penrose Inquiry or, or, or elsewhere, and, and no, no statement um, that we were able to obtain from him for ourselves. Uh, so this is really what, what we have. Um, but the presentation is going to focus upon what, what is set out in this document, um, but before we look in more detail at it, Paul, could we have INQY 0000341? This is an explanatory note which the inquiry provided to core participants back in April 2020 when various documents provided to the inquiry were disclosed to core participants, including the, the statement that I've just referred to, the statement of Dr. Lane. Um, the purpose of putting this up on screen is really just to provide a, a bit of background because there are a number of different versions of Dr. Lane's statement. Um, we have, I think, something in the region of six or eight versions. Um, the two that we've referred to in the presentation are what's referred to as the draft number five, and that's the one with the reference that I read out a few moments ago, the CBLA 605 underscore 002 version. That draft is dated the 10th of December 1990. There is then um, a draft six dated the 11th of December 1990, we don't need to put it up on screen, but the, the reference to that um, for the transcript is CBLA 5034 underscore 002. That's a much shorter document. Um, if we go to the second page, please, of this note, we've explained towards the bottom of the page our understanding of the status of the draft proof of evidence. Um, so the second paragraph under the heading Dr. Lane's draft proof of evidence explains that the proof was prepared, as we understand it, with the assistance of Clifford Chance for the purpose of outlining CBLA slash BPL's response to the allegations of negligence and breach of statutory duty contained in the plaintiff's re-amended main statement of claim. So it, it arose in the context of the HIV haemophilia litigation. The CBLA had been joined as an additional defendant to that litigation. The CBLA retained Clifford Chance solicitors to represent them, and Clifford Chance took steps to obtain proof of evidence from, from Dr. Lane. As we've set out there, there are a number of different drafts. Um, the reason for... Um, referencing versions five and six are as follows. They're the two latest in time, and version five is the, the, the most complete version. It appears, in fact, to be a complete draft, subject to the fact that there are certain questions, presumably questions from the, the solicitors um, in, in, in the text of it, certain drafts relating to... Um, a, a queries for, for Dr. Lane to follow up or documents to be followed up. Um, so that's why we have identified those two as the two documents um, that uh, um, may be most um, relevant to, uh, to um, consider. If we go back to CBLA 605 underscore 002, and if we just go purely by way of example... 
um, to page 53. If we look at paragraph 133, you'll see it, it refers to a document. The fourth line refers to document number 486. And there are documentary references throughout the Dr. Lane proof of evidence. The, the documents listed are documents in the CBLA's list of documents for disclosure in the HIV haemophilia litigation. Um, in, in order to find where those documents exist on, on our database, we provided a schedule um, at the same time as a note we looked at a, a moment ago. So in April 2020, we provided core participants with a schedule or spreadsheet which lists the document numbers, but also then provides the relativity reference number. So recognised legal representatives and those core participants who have access to relativity using that can find the documents referred to by Dr Lane in this proof of evidence. The other way of finding any of the documents that Dr Lane refers to on relativity is by going into the reference ID section of, um, of relativity and putting in the document number and that will produce it. Uh, and that, I hope, will make the life of anyone trying to make sense of Dr Lane's proof of evidence a little easier and um, being able to find the documents that he comments on. Yes, uh, I, I would hope that in, in what you say, uh, that if there are any particularly important documents, that those people who are members of the public but are not core participants um, will need to know what they, what they are, otherwise they won't be able to make sense yes. of it. Um, in, in fact, Dr Lane's proof normally um, either contains quite a decent description of the document so that you can see what it is, or quite often contains an extended quote from it. In the presentation note, we've referred to um, some of the documents in, in more detail. I'm not this afternoon going to go to very many of the contemporaneous documents. That's really for two reasons. The first is um, we've seen a, the key ones already, either in the course of this week or, or in the course of earlier hearings. The second reason is um, we, we, we'd be here for longer than an afternoon or, in, frankly, longer than a week. There are so many documents referred to in such detail in the draft proof of evidence. So I, I'm actually only going to, 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 to go to a handful of them. Um, but it, it's, it's, not, it's not particularly difficult to make sense of what Dr Lane is saying because he gives this quite detailed description of most of the documents that he's referring to. Now, I, 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 am I entitled to infer, because this is a, a draft plainly prepared by solicitors for him to look at, that the ordinary process by which this draft would have been reached uh, would have been there would have been discussions between him uh, and the solicitors, in which he orally or in writing put out what he had to say. They then uh, organised it in a way which uh, suited the purposes of the litigation uh, and put it back to him to say, is this uh, fa fair and full? Um, and he would say, well, uh, and there would be further discussions about various aspects of it. Um, so that this fifth draft is not necessarily what he would have ended up saying, but it's a pretty good indication of what he would have ended up saying, if that was the process, which I think I'm entitled to infer, but you can confirm that, uh, would be almost certain to have happened. Certainly such documents as, as, as I've seen that, that emanate from Clifford Chance correspondence and, and, and so on, that nothing of any great moment in the contents of them, but they, um, they are in absolutely consistent with the process which you describe. What, of course, it's important to bear in mind in relation to this proof of evidence and um, um, your evaluation of its contents in, 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 in due course is um, it, it was never finalised, it was never signed. Uh, it was produced in the context of litigation and we'll see as we go through it, it's very much directed at responding to the allegations in the amended statement of claim in the HIV haemophilia litigation. Um, and it's very much aimed at putting forward um, the arguments of the CBLA 
as to why they should not be found to be negligent or in breach of any statutory duty. Um, so it is, it is in part a submission, um, and we'll see that Dr. Dr. Lane at various stages uh, um, uh, uh, identifies particular allegations and then sets out the CBLA's response to, to those allegations effectively. Um, so it's, uh, uh, it's tailored towards the defense of the CBLA's position in litigation. Uh, I don't, that's not, not just meant as a, as a criticism, it's merely a statement of fact. That's the purpose for which it was produced. As a result, although it's vast, it doesn't necessarily reflect the broader evidence that Dr. Lane could have given had, well, had this inquiry taken place m m many years earlier than, than it is. Uh, um, it, it doesn't contain some of the, some of the analysis observations, some of the more discursive reflection that, that others who've provided written statements or indeed oral evidence to this inquiry have been able to, to bring to bear because it was produced for the purposes of, of defending litigation. It also essentially stops in 1985 and its, um, uh, its content is focused upon the particular allegations that were being levelled against the CBLA in the litigation. Yes, it, it, I, I have to bear in mind, I think, that this is the director of, of an organisation which was a defendant. Yes, exactly. Uh, and Though normally, technically, a witness statement should contain and contain only statements of material fact, um, most of the statements that I've seen so far in this inquiry uh, have gone beyond that and expressed views. I suppose, in one sense, you can say it's a matter of fact as to what the view is of yes. CBLA, um, and, but I have to take, take care in, in looking at it that way yes. and, and concentrate on what the facts are uh, with the assistance that he can give, because he was he was there, he knew what uh, what other people around him uh, had in mind to do and why things happened. Um, take give such weight to his comments as I think appropriate. But precisely so. It's informed commentary, but it's being delivered from a particular standpoint yes. exactly, which is the standpoint of a defendant to, to litigation, um, and obviously was never completed because the litigation settled. And from the very particular standpoint, we saw an example about this perhaps this morning um, when um, there, was, there was discussion about what uh, uh, Dr. Smith, or so what Dr. Smith might have meant or might have been meant in, um, in documents, which the, the position of, of BPL uh, is not the position of uh, other parties or par parties, other, other people whose activities we are examining. Uh, absolutely. You have a very particular role to fill. Absolutely. And that becomes very clear because it's not simply that, that we are looking more widely than BPL. Um, even when we're looking at BPL, we're looking more widely than the CBLA. The CBLA came into existence in December 1982. And so, with some force... Dr. Lane points out at various stages in the statement that the CBLA, which is the defendant to the litigation, isn't responsible for decisions taken by others seven years before it came into existence. Yes. Um, and so um, it, that, that, that's why it, it, it's, it's an unfortunate fact that we don't have um, uh, any evidence from Dr. Lane in, in, a, in a broader context beyond... Um, I, beyond this litigation statement and, of course, beyond what, what, what you'll be able to see from, from the contemporaneous documents, most of which, as I say, you've already looked at. Yes, In terms of you. the key documents. Um, so much of the presentation is actually going to be a guide to the statement because it's, <laughs> it is a document that really does have to be read in full, but it takes a very long time to read it in full, um, I can assure you. Um, I'm going to start then just with a brief overview of Dr. Lane's career to put it in context before we dive into the statement. Prior to taking up his role at BPL, Dr. Lane had various medical positions in paediatrics, medicine and surgery. He became a senior house officer in pathology at the West Middlesex Hospital in 1961. Between 1962 and 1966, he was a research fellow in haematology in Glasgow, the Department of Pathology 
Royal Maternity and Samaritan Hospitals. And then from 1966 to 1973, he was employed as a scientific officer at the Medical Research Council's Experimental Haematology Unit at St Mary's Medical School. He also, um, during that period from 69 to 70, spent some time in the States um, as a senior fellow of medicine at the University of Washington's Department of Haematology and Medicine um, and at the King County Central Blood Bank in Seattle. Then from 1973 to 1975, he held a post as a lecturer in haematology at St. George's Hospital. And then from 1975 until his appointment to BPL, he was a consultant haematologist to the Northeast Thames Regional Blood Transfusion Centre in Brentwood, Essex. So it, um, not, I think, a regional transfusion director, but, but a consultant based at the Regional Transfusion Centre um, for uh, um, a period of time. In 1977, April 77, uh, he became the director designate of BPL in anticipation of Dr. Maycock's retirement, and then he took over from Dr. Maycock as director in September of 1978. Uh, there is an introductory section in his statement that's in his proof that's worth looking at, so if we can have the proof back on screen, please, Paul, CBLA 6005 underscore 002. If we go to page two, you'll see there's a section on BPL from paragraph four onwards. Mr. Hill has taken you to some of the, 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 the central facts in relation to um, BPL's uh, history, so I don't propose to go through um, the detail of that, um, but that continues from paragraph four through to paragraph 13. Um, he, you will see at paragraph 13 on page 5, um, Dr. Uh, Lane um, references there the medicines inspection of the BPL facility in April 1979, uh, and their report it was seriously substandard as a pharmaceutical manufacturing factory, and he picks up on that later in his statement, and I'll, I'll come back to that. If we go over the page... There's a very brief narrative in relation to PFL, but he mainly refers there to the evidence of Dr. Smith, which we, we looked at yesterday in that regard. Um, and then if we go to page seven, there's a section headed CBLA, um, and, and this is important for the reason I've already given. It's because the CBLA was the defendant, or one of the defendants in the litigation, um, and, and, but had only come into existence with effect from the 1st of December 1982. And you will see there set out um, uh, an account of the membership of the CBLA, which continues over the page, uh, details of the staffing of BPL, that, that is, I think, as at 1990, the date of the statement, 380 staff, in the case of PFL, about 30, um, and an account of um, um, who had been the first chairman of the CBLA, uh, um, and a, a brief account of the establishment of, of the CBLA, um, in, in, in November 1982. Um, you'll see towards the bottom of uh, paragraph 21, there's reference to an appendix. I should have said there are a number of appendices to um, Dr. Lane's proof. Um, I'm, I'm not, I think, likely to go to any of them, um, but I, I will just give details of the um, reference numbers for them. So they range from, and this is just for the transcript, Paul, you don't need to pull anything up, BPLL 0004825 through to BPLL 0004844. They cover a, a range of different issues. So the appendix as referred to here is simply a copy of the 1982 order which established the central blood um, laboratory's authority. The second appendix, which is referred to, if we go to the next page, paragraph 22, um, is a, uh, or, or includes a list of um, a, a range of committees, um, which um, may be uh, uh, useful at, at some point to consider. Um, there are then, there's then appendices regarding supply and demand, which Mr. Hill referred to in the presentation um, earlier in this week, and, and then a whole range of other matters um, 
uh, th those appendices have been disclosed to core participants, but it's not um, uh, my intention today to refer to them. Some of them gather together information. So, for example, the sum that, that gather together information about advice given by he to haemophilia centre directors. I, I don't know, we don't know who put the appendices together. There's nothing in, for example, that appendix, gathering together advice um, uh, relevant to haemophilia centre directors, that refers to any material that we haven't otherwise seen. It's not, in fact, complete. It, it, it doesn't include material that we have seen. Um, and so th the appendices themselves are not necessarily um, particularly reliable um, they may have been compiled by, by Clifford Chance, but that, that's, or some of them may have been compiled by Clifford Chance, but, that, but that's speculation on my part. Um, we can then see the next introductory heading in Dr. Lane's proof is the National Blood Transfusion Service. Um, and if we go over the page, we can see in paragraph 25... Um, Dr. Lane's description of, of the National Blood Transfusion Service, and this is a theme which um, em emerges in various points throughout his, um, his proof of evidence, and indeed in a number of the contemporaneous documents. So if I pick it up four lines above subparagraph A, Dr. Lane said this, it, that's the National Blood Transfusion Service, was in effect a loose confederation of 14 RTCs, regionally financed, which varied considerably from region to region and were neither controlled nor financed in the same way as BPL slash PFL, there were effectively four links with the Department of Health. And then he sets out those links. The first is the role of the part-time consultant advisor on blood transfusion to the Department of Health, um, uh, um, which, as we know, after Dr. Maycock's retirement, was Dr. Tovey, who, who thereby provided a link between the Department of Health and the regional transfusion directors but had no particular link with BPL, uh, unlike Dr. Maycock, and then became Dr. Gunson. Uh, the, the second link is the periodic meetings of regional transfusion directors, um, but as Dr. Lane there observes, this body was not constituted statu statutorily. The meeting carried no executive function, and although its purpose was in part to advise the consultant advisor, it served as an unofficial informal mechanism for exchange of information between constituent units of the MBTS and the Department of Health. Um, if we go to the next page, the third link between the Transfusion Service and, and Department of Health described as the Central Committee for the National Blood Transfusion Service formed by the Department of Health. We, we see there the terms of reference set out, and then if we go further down the page, in terms of its membership, Dr. Lane's says the part-time consultant advisor, the two elected regional transfusion directors were members of this committee. The committee included representatives nominated by the Royal College, other members. Chairman was the deputy chief medical officer of the Department of Health. And then the fourth link are the meetings of the regional donor organizers under the chairmanship of a senior administrator of the Department of Health. This particular committee existed largely to review publicity material for blood donor recruitment since much of this material, which was of a high quality, was produced separately by the Department of Health in conjunction with the Central Office for Information. So that's Dr. Lane's account of the links between the Blood Transfusion Service um, and the Department of Health. Obviously, we've, we've heard a range of evidence in relation to that. And then over the page... Um, this is a statement of, of, of opinion on the part of, of Dr. Lane... Um, but, but, but nonetheless worth um, considering. He says in paragraph 26, I think it is fair to say that the organisation which existed within the transfusion service during the period which is relevant to this litigation limited the development of the national aspects of the service. The RTCs were poorly represented centrally as described above and the central committee itself was only an advisory committee to the Department of Health. And on national or any other aspect of the transfusion service, the Department of Health was not, for procedural reasons, able to instruct regions on the allocation of finance to regional transfusion centres. The regional health authorities were not necessarily involved in national policy making for the MBTS, although central policies might require RHAs to commit allocations of extra funds from regional budgets to finance development at RTCs. Um, so in, 
in one sense, nothing there that we haven't heard from other sources. Um, but uh, we note there that that was Dr. Lane's perception um, as well. The next introductory section uh, of his proof uh, is headed haemophilia. I, I don't propose to go through um, anything um, that was um, is set out there by way of a very brief summary of um, in relation to bleeding disorders. If we go to page 14, there's then a heading, coagulation factors, preparation and use. Uh, there's a reference to Crow precipitate in paragraph 34. Um, halfway through paragraph 34, um, we can see Dr. Lane observing that cryo precipitate was the principal product used to treat haemophilia X for a long time uh, and confirming that BPL and PFL ha have never produced cryo precipitate. That's always been produced by the blood transfusion centres. Um, and then uh, we'll, you will note on the next page, um, paragraph 37, Do Dr. Lane provides details of the, the names of the BPL um, and PFL products. Um, so 8IP became uh, uh, HL, BPL Intermediate Purity Product, and then the PFL product, HCRV, as we've already heard. And then the intermediate concentrate factor 9 was 9D, and then he refers to these being replaced by the heat-treated products 8Y and 9A. Um, there is then um, uh, some observations about risks of viral transmission, which I'll come back to. There's a section in the statement starting on page 19 about HIV. Um, and then, if we go to page 20, you'll see the structure then of the statement that emerges. So, Dr. Lane sets out in the proof the, um, the claims advanced against the CBLA in the re-amended main statement of claim. And then, if we go um, over the page, we will see the first main topic which Dr. Lane addressed in the proof of evidence, and that's self-sufficiency and the blood transfusion service. Um, before we look at any of the, the, the detailed content of it, the structure of this part of Dr. Lane's proof was as follows. He set out an, an overview, setting out in broad terms his view on matters relating to self-sufficiency. He then sets out year by year, a chronological narrative, but it's a narrative by reference to individual documents. And what we don't know is how the documents were selected or by whom. Um, uh, and so um, uh, you, we'll see as we go through it, but he has a heading for each year, and he sets out certain documents relevant to that year. Um, not necessarily a comprehensive account, but nonetheless, there, are a, there is a lot of material that he refers to. Sometimes he simply describes the document and the event to which it relates. So a paragraph might simply say, I sent a memorandum, and, and then there's an accurate summary of what the memorandum said. Um, but quite often, there is additional comment or observation by Dr. Lane. And in what I draw your attention to this afternoon and, um, and, and uh, um, Tuesday morning, I'm going to be focusing on those paragraphs um, of relevance to the issues um, that, 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 that you're considering, where Dr. Lane does something more than just describe the document or the event, where he adds something by way of, by, by way of comment. Um, at the end of his, his review year by year in relation to self-sufficiency, there is then a section of this, the proof in which he sets out, or the solicitors have set out for him, the allegations against the CBLA in the re-amended main statement of claim, and then he sets out his response on behalf of the CBLA to those allegations. So that's the structure of the statement, and that pattern is followed for the other um, subjects in, in the statement. So um, um, when he goes on to consider 
uh, hepatitis, HIV, heat treatment, and so on. It, broadly speaking, follows a, a similar structure. Um, so if we then turn to the first topic, which is um, uh, self-sufficiency, paragraph 59, Dr. Lane um, sets out the essential argument, um, or, or his characterization of the essential argument in the claim, that had England and Wales been self-sufficient in factor VIII concentrate, fewer haemophiliacs would have required imported commercial factor VIII concentrate, which carried a higher risk of contamination with HIV. Um, and then um, paragraph 60 re refers to the position in relation to factor IX, um, the assertion that England and Wales was self-sufficient in relation to factor IX. And then paragraph 61 sets out Dr. Lane's response in a nutshell, my own opinion is that the plaintiff's contention is probably correct. In a way, the data that has emerged with regard to the relative extent of HIV infection amongst haemophilia B sufferers treated exclusively with NHS factor IX produced by BPL slash PFL suggests that pro rata there was a lower incidence of infection when compared with the rate of infection of haemophilia A sufferers who used commercial US factor VIII concentrate. So far as we're aware, there's little difference between factor VIII and IX in terms of their inherent potential to transmit HIV when manufactured from infection, infected donations of plasma. And the quantity of factor IX required to treat severe haemophilia B sufferers is comparable with the quantity of factor VIII used by haemophilia A sufferers. Um, over the page. Um, nevertheless, the pro rata incidence of HIV infection amongst haemophilia B sufferers is lower, and he sets out the two factors which he thinks reflects that, of which the second is the fact that factor IX was manufactured exclusively from plasma voluntary donated in the UK. Um, um, however, having, having agreed broadly with the plaintiff's contention that had there been self-sufficiency in factor VIII, um, uh, fewer haemophiliacs would have required imported concentrates which carried the higher risk of contamination. He then qualifies that in paragraph 62 um, in the following terms. And I, again, I'm, go I'm going to read it out because this is an important part of, 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 of um, the position that he was advancing. Um, picking it up in the third line of paragraph 62, he said this, because of the chronology associated with the emergence of HIV and the length of time that it takes to achieve self-sufficiency, it would be necessary to plan and build a manufacturing facility during the mid-1970s for production to have reached anything like the level necessary to satisfy the needs of the haemophilia A sufferers by the late 1970s when HIV, as it is now known, appeared. Pausing there, it may not be inaccurate to say that HIV first appeared in the late 1970s, but it's n not entirely clear whether what he's saying that essentially by 1979 or the late 1970s, the die was cast in terms of HIV infection, because that wouldn't be reflective of the evidence the inquiries heard, which is that most of the infections took place during the course of the first half of the 1980s. Um, in, in any event, the other point that Dr. Lay makes is, is about the length of time it would take to um, plan and build a manufacturing facility. And he says there, the planning and financing of increases in the supply of FFP would have required a similar timetable. In short, any decision to pursue self-sufficiency as a goal could only have been taken at a time when HIV was unknown and therefore on the basis that self-sufficiency was not just desirable but necessary for some other reason. The plaintiff suggests that such a reason was the risk presented by hepatitis and contend that as with HIV, US commercial factor VIII concentrate manufactured from plasma donated by paid donors was inherently more dangerous than the equivalent NHS product manufactured from voluntarily donated plasma. The reasons given under the heading hepatitis below, that's a stage of his statement that I'll come on to later, my view is that this is fallacious. Additionally, hepatitis is very different indeed in terms of risk when compared to HIV. Now, those are statements that you'll be able to assess um, the, the validity of for, for yourself. Um, what I think in terms of direct evidence is perhaps more, more instructive is what Dr. Lane said in the next paragraph. Okay, can I just come back yes. to one aspect of it? Let's just go back to the previous page.
So page 20, previous page, please. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, it, it's, it's what he, he says. Um, how about halfway down? The, the, the sentence beginning in short. Uh, he he's, seems to be saying that it, it, the goal of self-sufficiency, if it was desirable, that's not enough for parliament or government or, or a proper administration to decide that that's what they should have. Possibly. Of course, um, the goal of self-sufficiency was neither ultimately the the policy of CBLA and, and, and he's tailoring his evidence to what might or might not be, as it were, laid at the door of the CBLA. Yes. Um, he goes on to say a little more at various places in the, in the statement of, uh, about that. But, but yes, I mean, he's, in one sense, obviously, the first part of that sentence is correct. The decision to pursue self-sufficiency in order to have had the effect of avoiding HIV would need to be taken not, not on the basis of HIV, no, no, it, it, because that, that, you don't know. Obvious. But, but it, 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 that lead, leave aside the question of, of whether one takes into account uh, unknown viruses. Exactly. But, um, but it's the, it was the, the idea put, which seems to be put forward, which I'll have to give further thought to, that what he's looking for is something which is not just desirable, but necessary. Uh, and that's a curious word. It, it is, and it's a very high test, or a high threshold, potentially, to surmount. Yes. Um, it, if we go to... The, uh, and, of course, I mean, amongst other matters, as, as I, we saw in Dr Smith's, um, one of Dr Smith's statements, um, but by 1975, the World Health Organization itself was in, endorsing um, self-sufficiency... Uh, for for nations, uh, and uh, w whatever one may may say about what happened, uh, Parliament itself was told and, and seemed not to disapprove uh, of a, a policy announced by the Minister of Health at the time uh, that self sufficiency should be the aim. Yes, uh, and that plainly wasn't on the basis of HIV as HIV. No. no. Yes. So if we go to the next page and look at paragraph 63, this is Dr. Lane's take about the goal of self-sufficiency in the 1970s. He says self-sufficiency was considered desirable, but it was not seen as an imperative in that external alternative sources of supply were available. That, that too, is potentially quite curious because clearly the external sources of supply, he must be referring to commercial concentrates. But in one sense, the whole point of self-sufficiency is to avoid the need for the use of commercial concentrates. So it's a, it is arguably a, a, a slightly um, a, a, um, um, odd way of, of looking at things. It is, of course, only one sentence, but there, there is, as we'll see a little more later on. What we then get in the next couple of paragraphs is um, uh, uh, Dr. Lane setting up the position in relation to the CBLA, he makes the point, which is absolutely correct as a matter of fact, that by the point in time in December 1982 when the CBLA took over responsibility for BPL, approval had already been given um, for the um, rebuilding of the, the new manufacturing facility um, and upgrading of the existing uh, facility. Um, and so that, I, I, as I understand it, leads to his assertion in paragraph 65 in these circumstances CBLA cannot be responsible for a failure to achieve self-sufficiency aside from the fact that in common with their predecessors in managing BPL PFL they did not control the transfusion service and more importantly the funds necessary to substantially increase production um, it, it, it's, it's an, um, unfortunate really that, that what we have from, from Dr Lane is only this statement in the context of the litigation because what we don't have and um, perhaps more fully is a um, um, is a what's and all account of, of, of more widely of, of, of what um, his, his fuller views might have been because he is here focused upon the position of the CBLA. Well he, he's saying that uh, it, it, 
self-sufficiency wasn't necessary. It might have been desirable, it wasn't necessary, but anyway, you can't blame CBLA yes, for it. That, that is essentially what he's saying. Or for failing to achieve it, I mean. Um, now, it, if we go over the page, he <laughs> also sets out some um, views in relation to um, the position of the... Uh, uh, the, the earlier period, 1978 to 1982, and, and, and this may be, um, uh, again, maybe something that will need to be looked at with a degree of um, uh, uh, critical analysis. He says in paragraph 67, nor do I believe that any decision taken during the period from 1978 to 1982, when Northwest Thames were responsible for BPL, would have made any difference to the scope of the problem now faced by the plaintiffs. If at the time Northwest Thames took over from the Lister Institute in 1978, a decision had been taken to rebuild the manufacturing facility, it would not have been ready in less than three to four years, based on our subsequent experience after 1982, and would only have been commissioned in about 1981 to at the earliest. It is my opinion, see my comments under the heading aids below, that by this time, the majority of severely affected haemophiliacs who were using the largest quantities of commercial factor VIII throughout the latter part of the 1970s had already become infected with HIV. And, and the factual basis for that may be questionable. Um, again, I will look and see what he, what he says later in, in the proof. But we, we have seen... Uh, um, evidence of a range of dates of zero conversion yes. um, carrying on well, well in, into 83, 84, indeed 85. Well, yes. Obviously, in some cases, even 86. But, um, that that that's raises um, uh, slightly different issues. And then he says in paragraph 68, in my opinion, to aim for self-sufficiency with a view to achieving it before the emergence of HIV would have to have involved taking a decision to do so and starting to implement this by the mid-1970s, and as I described below, against the background of inability on the part of all those concerned to make any accurate assessment of what self-sufficiency really equated to, and a complete lack of any knowledge of HIV or the risk it was to prevent some eight years later. Um, the, the proof then um, refers to self-sufficiency in but Just, just yes. come back for a moment, just to make me think about that. Um, we, can I just have that highlighted? Paragraph the, the, the paragraph we were on, this previous page. Um, it, it's the risk it was to present some eight years later. Uh, and what he's saying in the paragraph before is that uh, he sees the majority um, of the severely affected haemophiliacs using the largest quantities of commercial factor VIII were already infected by 1981-82. Um, and that would have been a, it must be a bell-shaped curve or something of, something of the sort. So eight years back from then is 1973. So I just don't quite at the moment see how that fits together. Yes. Well, the eight years might be a reference, I, possibly, if you take the mid-1970s, um, in paragraph 68, to 1983, which you could say is the year in which the risk of, of HIV, uh, htlb 3 8 um, became, became yeah. particularly acutely unknown. Or one, one might reasonably think it, it, it did, yes. So it, um, when HIV was known in 1982, it wasn't necessarily known as risk to haemophiliacs then. That's something I have to decide. Yes, I and mean, obviously there were the first reports of infections in haemophiliacs or AIDS in haemophiliacs halfway through 1982. But 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 absolutely, um, it, it, the, the 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 volume of evidence mounts up as we get into into 1983 and continues to increase. Um, I'm, what, what, the, 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 there are a number of different points that Dr. Lena it, it would seem is is making here. Um, the issue about inability to make an accurate assessment of what self-sufficiency really equated to is, is an issue which Mr Hill's been exploring in the course of the week, yes. and, and we'll come on to see what Dr Lane says about um, various aspects of that in sh shortly. Um, the, the reference to complete lack of any knowledge of HIV or the risk it was to present some eight years later goes back to this point about that he's saying, so, well, self-sufficiency might have been desirable but wasn't necessary because we didn't know... Um, uh, of 
of, of um, the existence of something like a, a HIV. That obviously begs questions in relation to hepatitis, which we'll, we'll look at what he says about hepatitis in, in, in the course of um, the statement. Um, but it also obviously raises the question that you referred to a few moments ago of, of unknown viruses and, and, and whether there was a proper understanding of, of, of the inherent dangers of, of use of blood and blood products. Um, or whether you simply had to wait until HTLV3 came along and then respond. I mean, it, it, it may simply be a very clumsy way of saying um, a lack of knowledge or, 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 uh, or, risk, or knowledge of the risk, which you only had eight years later, so as you pointed out. But even then, that, would, that wouldn't put it in the mid 70s. Mid, the, sorry, the, the, yes, you put it, I suppose, in the mid 70s, at the very earliest, 75, with some. Yes, it's curious. Curious number of years to choose, I think. Um, so we, we then um, have a heading self sufficiency in detail. And if we go to the next page, having referred to a couple of the appendices, in paragraph 71 of the proof, Dr. Lane um, suggests it might be sensible to distinguish the period 73 to 77 and then 78 to 85, because it's the latter period when he was um, um, directly uh, working uh, at um, BPL. Uh, and so he says the, his comments in relation to that first period, 73 to 77, are derived from an examination of the documents with the benefit of my background knowledge as a consultant haematologist working in the North East Thames Regional Blood Transfusion Centre. Then in relation to the second period, he says he was director of BPL. He had first-hand knowledge of the events relevant to the issue of self-sufficiency. And then he explains um, why the end of 1985 has been taken um, as a cut-off. Um, so if we turn over the page... We'll see the heading 1973 to 1977, um, uh, and um, we can see here um, um, some of the observations that, that Dr. Lane makes in relation to that. I'm obviously not going to be reading out vast chunks of the statement, or we'll be here forever, but there are some paragraphs which I think are really quite important to read, and this is, um, this is one of them. So... Dr. Lane said this, self-sufficiency was considered a desirable objective, there's that word again, from about the early 1970s for several reasons. And then he identifies, um, first of all, the World Health Organization um, uh, 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 advocacy. Um, and then he observes, from the, this is five lines down, from the point of view of England and Wales, another reason why self-sufficiency appeared desirable was the economic one, there was a general belief that it was more economic to manufacture factor eight through the state-owned BPL, PFL, than to purchase commercial products on the open market. Although Dr. Lane then raises some questions about the economic argument on the basis that um, th there was never a, a real assessment of what the cost was to, to globally as well to the, to the state of, of, of BPL. Um, and if we look at the last few lines on that page, he, he says, since BPL, P PFL were fractionating FFP produced by transfusion centres funded by regional health authorities, there was a cost involved. Not correct to characterise the NHS concentrates as truly free. He also observes there was no system for charging regional health authorities for the product. Go to the top of the next page. He repeats his view that self-sufficiency was seen as desirable but not immediately essential. This is now, he's saying, at the start of the 1970s. And then he sets out what he says were a number of obstacles in the path of self-sufficiency. Um, the first, and this is paragraph 74, was the lack of proper financial coordination to implement policies covering blood transfusion centres who had to produce the plasma, BPL, which had to fractionate it, the haemophilia centres, which which made the decisions in relation to treatment. So lack of coordination is his first point. At paragraph 75, he then talks about um, the consequences of the system of funding whereby um, uh, it was regional health authorities who were responsible for the allocation of budgets uh, and the Department of Health would not intervene. And then he contrasts that, this is about nine lines down in paragraph 75 
with the position of BPL and PFL, which he says were funded directly by the Department of Health, which closely controlled all but very minor expenditure. Um, uh, he continues by pointing out that the, whilst the regional health authorities controlled the blood transfusion services centres, there was no discernible benefit to them flowing from their expenditure to increase the supply of FFP for fractionation. Regional health authorities had no direct control over the funding of BPL and PFL uh, or, or any expansion in capacity to fractionate. No direct correlation between the fresh frozen plasma provided to BPL and the amount of factor rate which they received back until obviously we get to the pro rata system later. Um, and then um, uh, if we go over the page, paragraph 76, um, he, he um, uh, expands further upon this. Um, practice of the Department of Health in leaving regional health authorities to determine how they should spend funds allocated to them and the distinct reluctance of the Department of Health to interfere with the regional health authority autonomy created difficulties in striking a balance between increasing the supply of FFP and increasing the capacity of BPL to fractionate it. Um, so there is a more detailed explanation of what he means by the lack of financial coordination. Um, and then um, if we... Well, there's an observation in paragraph 78, almost an, an, an aside, but perhaps picks up on, I think, some, an exchange you had with, Dr., uh, with Mr. Hill. Um, uh, there is a description there of Dr. Maycock's responsibilities as consultant advisor to the Department of Health, um, uh, um, a role, um, all of which he did with the staff of one, no finance and no vested power or, or, or authority, is the observation at the end of paragraph 78. Dr. Lane then poses the rhetorical question, what was self-sufficiency? Reality proved difficult to forecast. And then he um, sets out a, a range of, of um, uh, facts, um, concerns, views um, about the issue of estimating the future requirements um, for uh, supply of factor eight concentrates. I'm not going to go through um, it line by line, but if we go over to the next page, paragraph 8, he makes the point that throughout the 70s, estimates of factor eight use were constantly increasing. Um, and then he sets out um, uh, um, a number of um, points in relation to, to those estimates. And um, paragraph 81, he says, first of all, there was uncertainty as to what was actually being produced at any given time, and that's a reference to variability in quality of plasma and uh, um, uh, yield of factor eight. Secondly, this is his paragraph 82, he says in, in terms of estimating demand, particularly in the early 70s, the um, uh, uh, there were problems because uh, it, it was largely cryoprecipitate that had been the basis for treatment, and there was a lack of exactitude in estimating international units of factor eight. And then over the page, paragraph 83, um, there is a further discussion there in relation to um, what he describes as the compromise between yield of factor eight and purity of the product. Um, if we pick it up at paragraph 84, what he says is this, the underlying problem in retrospect is that those involved were sometimes thinking of different things when considering self-sufficiency. For Dr. Maycock and some of those in the DH, self-sufficiency was considered to mean the amount of plasma and concentrate produced from it, which was needed to treat haemophiliacs in the way they were treated using cryoprecipitate. For others, particularly some clinicians, it was the amount wanted by their patients to lead as near normal a life as possible estimates arrived at on either basis were, as we now know, wrong. Um, and then what follows um, from paragraph 85 onwards, if we go over the page, um, it is a discussion of a range of documents relevant to issues about estimates of demand, supply, and, and discussion of self-sufficiency. Um, as I say, I'm, I'm not going to go to each and every one of them, um, um, or indeed to the vast majority of them, not least because some of the most important ones have already been flagged up uh, by uh, Mr. Hill. Um, if we...
going over to page 33, we've got the heading 1974, um, and, and this is Dr Lane's summary, or be it a summary from the perspective of someone not directly involved with the issue at this time. He says, the year was one taken up with discussions about the need to increase the production of factor eight, and although the then Health Minister, Dr. David Owen, became involved, not much was achieved. The focus was very much on 1975 um, and the steps which might be taken uh, during that year. Um, uh, just note, bottom of page 34, so over the page, um, paragraph 92, uh, Dr. Um, Lane picks up on, um, by, by reference to documents, but perhaps no doubt also informed by his own knowledge, um, the need for investment in a new fractionation plant, this is the fourth line of paragraph 92, and this requiring a policy decision um, by uh, the Department of Health. Um, if we just go to page 36 now, paragraph 96, as I say, I'm going, I'm going to skate over most of the, the, the documents themselves, but this is um, the first reference to, to a repeated theme in Dr. Lane's proof. I mean, it relates to Dr. Lane's relationship with Mr. Watt, director of the Plasma Fractionation Centre in Scotland, and his scepticism, this is Dr. Lane's scepticism, about what was being said in Scotland and his scepticism about whether the PFC could provide any assistance in fractionating plasma produced in England and Wales. I'll show you a number of references in the course of the proof. But here we have um, uh, um, um, Dr. Lane saying this. Um, this, is, this is reference to um, a, uh, I think a, the, a, a meeting of haemophilia centre directors on the 1st of November 1974. Uh, and it says this, Mr. Watt chipped in on two occasions with comments relating to Scotland. His tendency in these meetings, as I discovered when I was employed by BPL, was to talk either in terms of what Scotland aimed to do rather than what it was doing, or to try and score points wherever possible by stressing how much more advanced Scotland was compared with England and Wales. In practice, this was not too difficult, given the disproportionate amount of money per capita which Scotland was receiving and spending on its transfusion service and associated fractionation installation at this time and for some years after. Uh, in the course of looking at Dr. Smith's evidence this morning, sir, I drew attention to Dr. Smith's evidence about the good working relationship he had um, with Dr. Foster, so the, the good relationship between the scientists involved in research and development. But there is distinct evidence of attention at a, at a managerial level. Um, in particular um, between Mr. Watt and Dr. Lane. Um, and that's something that we may pick up on in the course of the presentation on Scotland next week. Um, but this is the first of a number of references in, in Dr. Lane's proof um, in which he takes issue with what's being said by Mr. Watt or, or what's being put forward about the Plasma Fractionation Centre. Um, if we move to page 38... We get to Dr. Lane's comments on 1975. Um, um, he deals with 1975 in paragraphs 99 to 109 of, of his statement. I just want to look at um, a couple of the paragraphs. Firstly, paragraph 99, he refers to statements in Parliament from Dr. David Owen. Um, the second half of paragraph 99 is, um, as I read it, Dr. Lane's own comment, he says this, although the stated intention of the minister was to make the United Kingdom self-sufficient in two or three years, a one-off payment with a view to producing factor eight from some 275,000 donations was clearly not sufficient without continuing investment to increase the production of factor eight beyond this figure. So I, I take that as a, as, a, as a comment from Dr. Lane. Um, and then if we go over the page to paragraph 104, oh, sorry, page 40, Paul, my apologies. 
Um, he re refers in the preceding paragraph to a, a, a March 1975 memorandum, uh, and then um, we get Dr Lane's comments in paragraph 104. He says that this gives some clue to the mismatch between the target of producing factor eight from 275,000 donations and what was actually required. My belief, as previously indicated, is that Dr. Maycock and the DH were concentrating on what was believed to be the appropriate level of production to treat patients when a bleed occurred. Use of factor eight for home prophylaxis, which was to become the norm, was a significant factor which may in part explain some of the discrepancies between what BPL actually resolved to produce and what others estimated was actually needed. And then he refers to um, a reference in the memorandum um, to factor eight yield from plasma being in the order of 30 to 40 percent. And again, this is Dr. Lane's um, take on the document. This is frankly absurd, absurd even at the time this memorandum was produced. At the time, yields would have been in the region of 20 percent. And I'm somewhat puzzled as to why figures which were obviously very optimistic were not challenged by Dr. Maycock at the time, since he obviously received a copy of the memorandum and his manuscript note gives no indication of disagreement with this part of the text. Um, if we move to 1976, then, on page 43, uh, and 1976 is covered in paragraphs 110 to 131 of the proof. Um, uh, again, I don't propose to look at um, them in their entirety. You'll note the observation in paragraph 110 um, by Dr. Lane is, this year was yet again punctuated by confusing statements as to targets for the achievement of self-sufficiency. We go over the page then and pick matters up, uh, sorry, pulled previous page, bottom of, bottom of page 44, paragraph 114. Um, this is um, a, a reference to uh, a um, practice introduced uh, according to the proof in December 1976, um, whereby NHS factor concentrate was delivered to the regional blood transfusion centres in an amount proportional to the number of patients treated at the haemophilia centres of that region in 1974. Um, and then if we skip down a few lines, picking it up on the fifth line on that page, up until that point, I think it's fair to say that the distribution was somewhat ad hoc. The documentation from the early 1970s reveals correspondence from clinicians on behalf of individual patients seeking supplies direct from BPL, and there seemed to be no established and formalised procedure adopted with regard to the distribution of concentrates, particularly one which encouraged blood transfusion centres to increase their supplies of FFP to BPL. And essentially what he identifies is, is, is really three stages. The ad hoc position prior to December 1976 the scheme introduced with effect from December 1976, and then the pro rata scheme, and we see a reference to that in paragraph 115. He says, the scheme introduced with effect from the 1st of December 1976 was a prelude to a later arrangement which I was instrumental in introducing after I became director of BPL, which we called pro rata. Um, and then he goes on to give a description of the pro rata scheme, which I, I don't need to go to because we've heard uh, lots of evidence about that. Um, but those, in any event, are his views about the, the position in relation to supply um, prior to um, the introduction of what, of what he refers to as the prelude to the pro rata scheme. If, if we turn on then next to page 47, just draw attention in paragraph 119 um, to a further um, uh, uh, um, reference to, to Dr. Watt, we pick it up halfway through paragraph 119, and this is uh, uh, Dr. Lane commenting upon a, min, uh, a meeting that took place on the 11th of March 1976. Halfway through that paragraph, Dr. Lane says this, typically, Dr. Watt from PFC in Scotland suggested that Edinburgh's yield was in the region of 30 to 35 percent, and that their aim at Edinburgh was to achieve a 70% yield. Not only was the yield of 30 to 35% much higher than I would have expected was possible at that time, but 70% was, frankly, ludicrous in any view. 
For the same reason, I would be suspicious about the costings contained in the same document where Mr Watt, again trying to go one better, suggests that the Scottish product costs 4.2 pence per international unit against the NHS product, which seems to have been estimated, I'm not sure how, at costing 6 pence um, per uh, international unit. Um, and then, um, bottom of that page, um, paragraph 120 refers to a paper prepared by Dr. Maycock. I'm not going to take you to the underlying paper. I think it's probably one you've already seen. Um, uh, but just to Dr. Lane's commentary on it. So he says, the figures in this paper look rather more satisfactory um, than some of those appearing in Dr. Maycock's earlier calculations, although a 30% yield, which he assumes is still, in my view, too high, 20% would have been closer to the real yield. Um, uh, and then there are some further observations on figures um, in, in, in the following um, uh, uh, sections of the statement. Um, if we then perhaps turn to page 51 next. Uh, um, this is in paragraph 128. Dr. Lane talking about uh, um, a um, document produced by Dr. Maycock. Uh, it, it, it's a, a account in fairly... Um, forthright terms. Um, Dr. Lane says this, picking it up perhaps in the fourth line, clearly the idea that 40 million international units was to be the target was pointless. It was, as far as anyone could tell at the time, the existing, not the future demand, and any planning exercises needed to look, exercise needed to look well beyond existing usage to future demand and plan accordingly. The graph sketched out at the foot of the last page suggests that Dr. Maycock believes the demand would flatten out quite considerably notwithstanding the extraordinary steep climb to the level of consumption as it then stood. This was unfortunately entirely bogus. In my view, there were no grounds for believing that the demand would follow the pattern shown on the graph. And then he goes on to talk about his attempts at estimating likely demand when he joined BPL in 1977. Now, again, I'm not, I'm not going to go to the underlying accuracy or otherwise of the, of the documents themselves, um, but it, it perhaps casts some light on um, some of the difficulties that appear to have been experienced uh, at the time. Uh, and then if we go over the page, we can see in paragraph 131, this is Dr. Lane's summary about 1976. Obviously, he's looking back because he was not involved at the time, so he's looking at the documents, but presumably bringing his own subsequent knowledge to bear. And he says this, summarising 1976, the year appears to have been dominated by the continuing cryo-precipitate debate, the implementation of increases in production facilitated by the £500,000 injection of finance, and debate about the target necessary to achieve self-sufficiency and the confusion sown in all this by targets which related to capacity to produce rather than volume necessary to achieve self-sufficiency and to what was needed rather than what the patients and clinicians wanted. Throughout the debate, there is no intervention from the Department of Health. At the time, the mismatch between what was being achieved with a struggle, what was required to meet the current self-sufficiency requirements in concentrate, and what, had anyone looked beyond current usage, would be necessary to achieve self-sufficiency for the future was all too obvious. Decisive action would have been required, backed by considerable funding, to plan a facility which would be ready by the end of the decade and of a size which would leapfrog sufficiently far ahead to cater for the burgeoning demand for factor eight concentrate. Um, so on one view of what Dr. Lane is there saying, he's saying, it could be said, he's saying that in 1976, it was obvious what was needed, um, which was the provision of funding and the policy decision to rebuild BPL. Yes. Um, we're now at 1977, page 53. We've still got quite a few years to come. Um, paragraphs 132 to 166 of Dr. Lane's proof deal with 1977. He now goes into rather a lot more detail because obviously this is the point in time at which he took up the position of uh, director-designate. Uh, um, 
Mr Hills referred to this already, but it's just perhaps worth looking again at what Dr Lane says in paragraph 132, um, in which he says in the third line, I should point out, and this will be apparent from many of the minutes of the meetings between April 1977 and September 1978, that Dr Maycock kept me very much in the background. He continued to attend transfusion directors' meetings, etc., as a representative of BPL slash PFL without me. And although, as I explained below, I was given some specific work to do in planning for the stopgap stop proposals to further upgrade the BPL facilities, it was not until Dr. Maycock's retirement in September 78 that I found I was able to exert much influence or control over BPL slash um, PFL. Um, if we go next to page 55, Paragraph 137, um, now this is, I think, a reference to a meeting of Haemophilia Centre Directors in January 1977. Um, I'll, I'll double check that, but I think, I think that's what he's referring to in paragraph 137. In any event, I, I draw attention to it because it's, um, uh, we again see uh, a, a tension between Dr. Lane and uh, the PFC. Um, so there's a reference to about six lines down, Dr. Drummond Ellis, so he represented BPL at the meetings at this point in time, said that the maximum capacity for Elstree, including proportion made in Oxford, was 14 to 15 million un international units. It will be noted that Dr. MacDonald from the Royal Infirmary Glasgow said that Liberton had the capacity to make 60 million international units per year. He added that to reach this target, the centre would need about £25,000 for new capital equipment and money for extra running costs, including payment for staff operating a 24-hour shift system. And then this is Dr Lane's take. This figure was nonsense, but was not apparently challenged in the meeting if the minutes are correct. As I shall describe below, it subsequently became apparent that Scotland was not in a position to make any real contribution to the requirements in England and Wales for factor eight concentrate. But at this meeting, a comment was made that it seemed as if Liberton had capacity to supply factor eight for the whole of the United Kingdom. Um, and then there is a quote from um, what it said Dr. Waiter was saying at the bottom of the page about plans to divert plasma from south of the border to Liberton. Um, and then if we go over the page, Dr. Lane's take at the top of the page is, in fact, so far as I can tell, whatever plans the DOH may have had, um, nothing uh, ever came of them. Um, if we go to page 57 next, please, paragraph 143. Um, you'll see there Dr. Lane associating himself in terms of his agreement with a memorandum produced by Dr. Gunson in May 1977 about the, the organisation of the National Blood Transfusion Service. Um, and picking it up in the fourth line, Dr. Lane says, this was a submission, this is the document produced by Dr. Gunson, which embodied comments and views of all the directors of regional transfusion centres, including myself in my former capacity prior to joining BPL. As it transpired, it had very little impact. The thrust of the document was that there was a lack of central coordination within the National Blood Transfusion Service. And then um, Dr. Lane then um, elaborates upon that um, uh, in uh, the rest of this paragraph. And if we pick it up in the last uh, five lines or so, uh, Dr. Lane says, notwithstanding the submission, the problems identified in it persisted and it was only in 1988 that a national directorate for the NBTS was established. And then he observes, and, and we've heard this from evidence from Dr. Moore and others, the national directorate remains mainly advisory and without regional executive authority. Um, over the page, paragraph 144, we're on Scotland again. I've mentioned previously, says Dr. Lane, that there appears to be a disproportionate amount of money spent on the Scottish Blood Transfusion Service, and this discrepancy in funding is exemplified on page nine of the submission. Uh, and then he identifies the figures. In 1975-76, expenditure on the National Blood Transfusion Service in England and Wales, 15.8 million for a population of some 49 million. 
compared with expenditure of 3.5 million in Scotland, where the population was only 5.5 million. Um, and again, the, the reference to the need for a central organisation for national planning if the NHS was to receive sufficient blood uh, and blood products. Um, if we then just look at um, bottom of page 59, um, there's reference there to a report um, produced um, for the Advisory Subcommittee on Blood Products and Blood Group Reference Laboratories of the Central Committee for the National Blood Transfusion Service. That's paragraph 148. Um, and then Dr. Lane sets out a, 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 over the page um, a, a, a citation from it. Um, it's been referred to in Mr. Hill's presentation. What I wanted to show you is, is what Dr. Lane says on page 61. So having, having set out a, a, an extract from the document, paragraph 151, he refers to and sets out a particular passage, um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, which concludes with the sentence, planning the future of BPL should not wait until the problems of PFC have been resolved. And then we see at paragraph 152, Dr. Lane says this, it was at my insistence that this paragraph was inserted. The indecision as to whether or not to redevelop BPL in line with what, with what was clearly required by this time, and this time is now 1977, um, was becoming confused by DOH intentions to utilise PFC Liberton to some extent, a state of affairs which was not helped by exaggerated claims made by the director of PFC Liberton, that's Mr. Watt again, for its operational capacity. Um, Dr. Lane then sets out a reference to an appendix to the report. Again, this is a document you've already looked at, so I'm not going to go over, um, over it, but you'll see over the page, um, at paragraph 155, Dr. Lane sets out the, the, the conclusions he'd recorded in the appendix. Um, if we just pick it up because it may be of relevance when you come to evaluate some of Dr. Lane's broader statements about self-sufficiency. Um, uh, at the end of that first paragraph that we see on the screen, Dr. Lane says that the effect of shortage of finance can be mitigated in several ways, which this paper seeks to show. And then if we go to the next page, point D is adhering to the Department of Health's principle that the health service shall make all possible attempts to become self-sufficient. The director designate of BPL, so Dr. Lane hopes the central advisory and executive bodies will reaffirm their intent to make the NBTS self-sufficient. So it, it, it did appear to be, it does appear to have been Dr. Lane's view in 1977 that self-sufficiency was absolutely the goal. Um, even though we've seen the earlier passage in his statement where he suggests it was a, a desirable rather than a, a, a necessary objective. Um, just observe paragraph 50, 156, he says that report generated a limited response uh, from the Department of Health. Um, let me just finish 1977 before we break. So if we go to um, if we go over the page to page 64. Um, this is a reference to a meeting in October 1977. Again, you've seen reference to this meeting elsewhere. If we go to, the, uh, and, and um, Dr. Lane was present at this meeting. Um, if we go to the top of the next page, um, you'll see Dr. Lane um, suggests by reference to the minute that the Department of Health made it clear no commitment could be made at that stage to any specific solution then refers to um, Dr. Lane's summary of three main problems. Um, if we go over the page, sorry, yeah, always a problem taking, trying to take things too quickly. Go to the bottom of the previous page, paragraph 161. 
there's an, ex an extract there again from, from um, the, the, the document referring to Mr. Parrott explaining the Department of Health's thinking on future planning for BPL. And then over the page, and this just is to give you Dr. Lane's take in his proof on, on, on aspects of the meeting, um, paragraph 162, um, referring to Mr. Parrott's use of the phrase low-cost selective development, Dr. Lane says this, I would comment this was not in line with Dr. David Owen's objective as stated two years previously, that self-sufficiency should be pursued. So that appears to be Dr. Lane's understanding of what the position was in terms of a policy. And then, again, Scotland, um, it's also worth noting that the wheels were beginning to turn in Mr. Parrott's mind as to the advisability of reliance on the Scottish plant. However, his manuscript amendment refers to not being totally reliant on the Scottish PFC at Liberton. At this stage, Mr. Parrott had not yet been um, to uh, Scotland. Um, there is then, uh, uh, if we just look at paragraph 164, a reference to Dr. Maycock's first stopgap paper. I don't need to take you to that, but if we just go to the next page, we see Dr. Lane's... Um, observation, um, I'm bound to say that the report itself was prepared without knowledge of Department of Health's intention so far as Elstree was concerned, particularly with respect to the planned use of PFC Liberton. So you'll have seen by now a consistent theme in the proof of evidence is Dr. Lane's concern about um, what he says are the claims being made by Liberton, but also his concern that somehow um, the, in, the consideration of the use of Liberton, which he thinks is essentially not a good idea, um, and you'll have to evaluate for yourself in due course, sir, perhaps whether that he was right or not, but uh, his concern that that's somehow having an effect on the decision-making process in relation to the Department of Health. So that brings us to 1977, end of 1977, um, and to time for a cup of tea. Yes, well, I, I think... Um a cup of tea will help us to reflect on, on that. Uh, quarter to four.